Manly Morris dancers were founded in 1934, but the origins of the dance go back further, certainly into the 19th century. Bob McDermott started dancing as a boy in Royton, just outside Oldham in Lancashire, at the end of the 1890s. Several of his brothers also danced, and this team was known as McDermott's Morris Dancers. There were several other Morris groups in the area, but the First World War took its toll, and Bob's dancing partner, Billy Holt, on the left, died in the war. In the late 1920s, Maud Carpleys from the English Folk Dance Society visited Royton and collected and published the dance from Bob and members of other Morris groups, indicating that there must have been similarity of dance steps and figures across the area. Meanwhile, in the tiny Cheshire village of Manley, midway between Helsby and Kelso, Dorothea Howarth had started folk dance evenings in the newly opened village hall. With advice from more Carpleys, Dorothea invited Bob McDermott to come to Manley and teach the Morris dance to the male folk dancers. The dancers included Arthur Webb and Albert Fletcher, as well as Dorothea's father Alfred, a Manchester cotton yarn agent turned farmer in Manly, and also her brother Leslie. The dancers made their debut at a music festival in Chester in 1936. The same year, they danced at Helsby Flower Show. The two front dancers are Albert Fletcher on the left, with Leslie Howarth behind him, and Arthur Webb on the right, with Bob McDermott in the middle. The issue of music for the dancers was resolved very early on, when Alfred Howarth heard one of his farm employees, Caleb Walker, playing the concertina. Alfred's grandson, Colin Howarth, takes up the story. My grandfather, Alfred, went down on the track to the station and um, for some reason or other he passed Caleb's cottage and heard him playing the concertina for, probably for chapel, he was probably practicing him tunes and he's, he jumped off, stopped the thing, jumped off and went in and said, Caleb okay, finished on Monday night and that was it. He never, he never, uh, he never, he never stopped. <laughs> the Second World War inevitably interrupted the dancing and afterwards the team was slow to restart. The railway timetables were such that Bob could travel from Royton to Molesworth Station close to Manly and back home in the evening. Graham Rathbone was taught to dance by Bob. And, uh, after the war, uh, Graham here <laughs> uh, joined the team, and uh, you were taught by Bob McDermott to dance. That's right, yeah. It was quite a bit after the war, I suppose. It was in uh, 52, uh, probably October 52, when I, uh, when I joined the team. And uh, my first recollection of Bob actually was, uh, I used to get a lift from Delamere with Caleb, which she was the Constine player. And, um, we used to pick Bob up at the, at the station down at Molesworth there, bring him up here, and, uh, and that was it. Uh, but he was a character. Oh, God, he was a character. I mean, he, he, he commanded the attention wherever he went, you know. Yeah. Oh, he stopped the show. Yeah. And dance, God, he was a fantastic dancer. Yeah. I mean, all right, we, we all think we can dance and whatever, you know, we pick our feet up and, and we dance, but oh, he was he was, he was foot perfect. Yeah. He was foot perfect. Yeah. The first major post war engagement was at the English Folk Dance and Song Society's Northern Festival in Hexham, Northumberland, in 1952, when the dancers were filmed by Bill Cassie. This is the only known film of Bob McDermott's clog stepping in a figure called Three Number Ones. The same year, the dancers were out in Norley, not far from Manly. These last two film clips show the dancers without hats, ribbon decoration on the britches, 
beads round the neck and arm ribbons. When the team was invited by the English Folk Dance and Song Society to dance at their Royal Albert Hall Festival in London in 1953, they completed the kit. London, where teams of young men from all over Britain and from overseas fill the vast arena of the Albert Hall with their annual New Year Festival of folk dancing and mime. With years of tradition behind them, these artists have given up much of their spare time to specialise in the rhythmic art of folk dancing, an art so closely bound up with our past history. In London, the team met the Loftus Sword Dancers from North Yorkshire, and together they entered and won the folk dance competition at the Langothlan International in Stedford. Here's Bob proudly standing alongside the trophy. While a couple of the dancers, Harold Elfield and Trevor Joynson, posed with a few of the locals. In 1955, the Manly Morris dancers visited Lytham St Anne's on Lancashire's Fylde Coast for Lytham Club Day and Rose Queen Festival. The visit was captured by the Hardman family and the film was later deposited in the North West Film Archive. Caleb Walker wasn't available, so Bob McDermott played the concertina and Arthur Webb led the dance. The dance is made up of a variety of figures which the conductor calls. The dancers don't know which figure is coming next. Same year, the team was invited to dance at an international festival in Oslo, Norway. And to help pay for the visit, the team toured local villages to dance and collect money. To encourage donations, they carried a wooden sign, Give two and sixpence and send us a mile on our way. The dance is being led here by Arthur Webb and the film shows the figures up in fours, outsides and ins and outs. And then the figure all in line or up in eights. The dancers were now performing at an increasing number of engagements, many of them close to home in Cheshire, but they also travelled to Scarborough in 1956, to Dublin and Cork in Ireland in 1958, and to London in 1963. This was one of the last occasions on which Leslie Howarth danced in the team, but the family connection continued with his son Colin playing the concertina. Uh, and for you, Colin, I mean, this is sort of like your third generation of the family. It's been important to the family. Oh yes, yes, very, very much. I mean, I mean, he danced from 1935 to 1964 mm -hmm. until his um, his bronchitis got too much for him and he couldn't uh, he couldn't dance. But he was he was very light on his feet. Uh, <laughs> but he was he was a gentleman. He was he was a, he was a tough. He was a cracker fellow. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and everybody thought the same of him in the team, you know, he, he really was, uh, he's a great man. There's been a lot of good men in it, you know, I mean, Albert, Albert Fletcher, he was a good servant to the dance, yeah. you know. And then, of course, as you mentioned, Arthur, Arthur Webb, he, he did a lot, did a lot for the dance. Another guy, Dennis Stark, he, he, he was a good club man, you know, him and Arthur, they used to sort of sit down together and and think these figures out, you know, think different figures out, you know, and they came up with uh, sort of coronation change as well, mm -hmm. and um, mm. uh, double dutch, yeah. you know, and all these new figures that were being introduced, and these lads used to sit down and do it, only, only ordinary working guys, you know. Because mm. it's, when you look at it, you could see that perhaps Bob was bringing new figures, because there are figures that for example, Maud Carpley's haven't written down in the books, but there are, there are figures that Bob was bringing in that, that Manley were learning from 
very early on. Mm. And then it was just seemed it was in the sort of tradition of the dance to bring in new figures. Uh, and new figures came in, coronation change came from the Queen's coronation. That's right, that's yeah. right, it did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, and, double uh, Dutch came from uh, took me out over to, uh, to Holland. Yes. Arthur Webb deputised as the team's conductor when Bob McDermott wasn't available, sharing the role with Leslie Howarth before becoming the principal conductor. Arthur sadly died suddenly during a day of dance with Winston Morris dancers in Derbyshire in 1986. Here is the team on an earlier visit to Derbyshire, led by Arthur. In the 1970s, the dance team organised dance weekends centred on Chester for the Saturday displays and greatly facilitated by the city centre's pedestrianisation. The famous Rose, a first floor series of shops with a common walkway overlooking the road below, enhanced the opportunity to watch the dancing and was an ideal spot from which to film the dancers. The Loftus Sword Dancers have been friends since the Albert Hall and Langothlin in 1953 and were the most frequently invited guests to the dance weekends. Here they are in 1984 in Chester.
In addition to six visits to London's Royal Albert Hall, the team also danced at the English Folk Dance and Song Society's Cecil Sharp House at a celebration of the life of former Society Director Douglas Kennedy in 1988. After Arthur Webb died, Graham Rathbone became the team's conductor. On four occasions, the dancers were invited to Abingdon, Oxfordshire, for Mayor's Day, when they elect the Mayor of Ox Street. This was in 1990. After their trip to Norway, the team travelled abroad to dance in the Netherlands, Ireland, France, Belgium, Lithuania and, in 1992, to a festival in Pajzitsa in Poland. The team was able to field 12 dancers here dancing in a large procession. The dance figure double dutch for 12 dancers is a bit tricky and then the figure ins and outs has to be danced in record speed. <laughs> For many years, Caleb Walker and then Colin Howarth were often the only concertina players, but in the 80s and 90s, Colin was joined by Roger Little, Chris Jaycott and Arthur Jones, all seen here, as well as by Mark Davis, Jim Gilbert and Caleb's grandson, Mike Penny.
In 2005, in the team's final days, Sheffield filmmaker Barry Callahan came to Chester to film the team, taking advantage of the secluded courtyard outside the commercial hotel. <laughs>
looking back on it, how oh, important has this been? <coughs> Marvellous. In my life, really. Mm. Uh, you know why? I mean, the, uh, well, I wouldn't have done half the things I've done in my life if it hadn't been for Morris Thompson. You know, mm. if I did, it wouldn't. Um, it gave me the opportunity to, to sort of uh, meet meet different people. That, that's that's the biggest thing. Because, you know, as a local lad, I mean, we, we were all locals then. We were, there were no professional men in the team. We were all working lads, certainly given... It's given the dancers a lot of pleasure and the dancers have given people a lot of pleasure, yeah. which again is the big thing, you know. Mm. Um, all over the country and, and all over Europe, oh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so, long live Matt. <laughs> <laughs>